Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you for taking the time to be here with us. My name is Jordan Johnstone, Digital Content Manager for Forward, and on behalf of the entire Forward team, we are so thankful for the women joining me on this webinar tonight to discuss a topic that so, so many women in the workplace are dealing with. With 2020, you know, might be behind us, thank goodness, uh, the effects will linger for quite a while. And one of those effects is the notable increase in mental and emotional stress and struggles. When everything was turned upside down in 2020, shifts and pivots happened for everyone. But women had a particularly difficult time as we had to take on additional responsibilities like homeschooling while also being expected to maintain our performance at work, even if we, or if we even still had our jobs. We lost our connection with our community, whether that was our family, our friends, our coworkers. We couldn't find weekly renewal with our church communities. So it's not at all surprising that there has been a surge in mental health struggles and emotional distress among women in the workplace. If you are joining us tonight because you feel God tugging at you to start to seek out understanding and next steps for dealing with how you've been feeling for the last year, we welcome you and we say thank you for being vulnerable and we hope that you understand that you are among friends tonight who have been walking paths similar to yours and are here to take your hand and walk forward. For those joining us on Zoom, please leave any questions you may have in the chat and make sure to send them to panelists and host. Uh, if you are watching us in the future, uh, make sure you register to be part of our next Zoom webinar so that you can interact with the moderator and panelists. So let's get started. Leading our discussion tonight is Dr. Shannon Crawford. Dr. Crawford is a licensed clinical psychologist, CEO of a thriving practice in Dallas-Fort Worth as a full-time psychologist and leadership consultant. She is the host of the podcast, Unlock You with Dr. Shannon Crawford, adjunct professor of psychology at the King's University and a longtime Forward community member. Dr. Crawford is delighted to serve as our moderator and is happy to field questions, but ethically we need to make sure it is clear that she is not offering therapy services, but rather she and our panelists will be offering general information to enrich your life and help you invest in practical coping skills that will equip you to thrive amidst life's many ups and downs. So Dr. Crawford, I now turn it over to you and our amazing panel. Thank you, Jordan. And as we have all lived and are continuing to live, the research highlights the impact of the pandemic specifically on the female workforce. The data suggesting that mental health for women is more likely to be affected than their male counterparts. With the various blurred, overlapping, and in some cases, competing roles and responsibilities. And this is having serious repercussions on females in their careers. Women are 48% more likely to be struggling with self-confidence in light of the events of the past 18 months, potentially holding some women back from sharing ideas and thriving in their workplace role. Statistically, women are also less likely to feel they have a say at work, reporting 55% poor work autonomy. My hope for this conversation is that we lay down our capes as leaders of constantly being on, serving, leading, gathering, and helping others to place the oxygen mask on our own faces so we can be refreshed, encouraged, equipped, and inspired to develop a lifestyle that helps cultivate a sustainable rhythm of self-care so we can be at the forefront, leading from health, even amidst inevitable future pivots that we will face. Tonight, we're talking about pivots. This is a catch-all term that includes anything from good and bad stressors. And I want to highlight the fact that some of you may not have gone through terrible events, but change, even if it's good, will still have an impact on you. And it still requires time to kind of regain our balance. Many of us have gone through transitions, job changes, school, child care changes, anything from joblessness to job promotions to added responsibilities to ever-changing job location, uh, navigating relationship adjustment and transitions, stressors of increased time together as couples and families. As a therapist, I've seen that a lot. And we may be working and even learning from home at the same time, competing for the same internet and time and energy and and noise levels. Stress on relationships, as many of us have experienced in the constantly evolving roles and responsibilities, has stretched us as individuals, couples, and families, and it stretched us quite thin at times. I am so grateful to Forward for spearheading this initiative to invest into women, 
to help us come out of the survival state that many of us, myself included, have been living in to restore our souls to wholeness so we can thrive as we advance toward our calling. Since 1984, Marketplace Chaplains has been serving small private to large public companies with a personalized and proactive employee care service delivered by male, female, and ethnically diverse chaplain care teams, which is available 24-7, 365 days. Marketplace Chaplains has over 1,700 chaplains throughout the United States and Canada. I am honored to introduce you to the prestigious panelists who will be removing their own capes to share authentically and at times even vulnerably from their own experience in giving insight and strategies. Our first panelist is Brenda Renderas, chaplain on the front lines. Based in Rancho Cucamonga, shout out to California, she has been with Marketplace Chaplains just over a year, doing her onboarding during COVID. Talk about huge adjustment. She is a life coach for women, spiritually, emotionally, mental health, and growth. She has worked with nonprofit organizations as a ministry leader in self-care, program director, and developing leaders, leadership teams for young adults and life group sectors. Brenda has also led relief teams overseas to countries like Cambodia, Thailand, El Salvador, and Mexico for humanitarian work. She thrives in life and group coaching, teaching, and public speaking. Brenda has her BA in Christian Studies and is currently in the International Coaching Federation certification process. Her life mission is to partner with people to find greater life balance and holistic health. Brenda is married and has three children. And from what I've heard, she's even on vacation, but has paused to spend this time with us. So I want to honor her for her commitment to be with us tonight. Our second panelist is Quabia Francis, Executive Director of Operations at Marketplace Chaplains. Quabia has served in ministry for the last 21 years. She is a member of the Gator Nation after earning two degrees from the University of Florida. Her theological training took place at Asbury Theological Seminary in Orlando, Florida, where she earned her master's in divinity in divinity degree in August of 2010. Some of the roles Quabia has played in ministry are children's pastor, youth minister, youth and family pastor, and lastly, her current position as executive director of operations with Marketplace Chaplains. She worked for Vitus Healthcare as a chaplain for five and a half years and has served with Marketplace for the last four years. Quavia is married and has five sons. That is impressive. And all the work accomplishments at the same time. Ultimately, Quavia's desire to please God in everything she does and says. Panelist, our third panelist is Rashia Green, and she is quite impressive. She is an executive vice president. Rashia Green joined Marketplace Chaplains in 2018 after 15 years of diversified management experience. She has operated in executive management roles at Simon Property Group for 14 years, developing high-level expertise in the following areas, business planning, budget management, service price, service pricing, strategic partnership, profit and loss analysis, creating and implementing policies and procedures, team building, property management, and branding. As EVP of the Western Region with Marketplace Chaplains, Rashia manages and supports operational leaders as they serve company leaders and chaplain care teams. Rashia is an ambassador of excellence, bringing a critical understanding of business and a sharp intuition for what organizations need and how to effectively deliver. And our last panelist is Jeanette Robert, Executive Director of Expansion. As Executive Director of Expansion with the Employee Care Service of Marketplace Chaplains, Jeanette travels the country educating and service, serving C-suite leaders of public and private companies as they internationally and proactively care for their employees and families. Speaking to the mental health of employees in the workplace, Jeanette has covered topics such as managing personal stress, leveraging technology for improved mental wellness, staff-centered care, mental health and workplace chaplaincy, and has been presenter for various conferences such as Workology, SHRM, Chamber of Commerce, CHRO Exchange, 
Religious Freedom and Business Foundation, and many more. She's also quite impressive. Jeanette resides in North Texas and is proud auntie of two nephews and six nieces who are the joy of her life. We are honored and privileged to have these ex distinguished leaders in each of their respective fields. So I'm going to jump into questions and I'll field them to each individual and we will see how the conversation goes. And ladies, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to write them in the chat box. We want to engage with you through our conversation. So Brenda, since you're on the front lines hearing from people in the workplace um, of workplace needs, creating webinars that are tailored to the current needs and feedback you're hearing on topics such as anxiety, depression, loneliness, substance abuse, and many more. Can you share some relevant stories to help us feel normal in our own struggles? Absolutely. So as I was going through the onboarding process, uh, there were definitely some of these stories that started to come to, to light. And my EDO, Hector Perez, approached me about putting together some webinars to be able to really have these conversations. And so through that, through a lot of the chat area of questions, even more of these stories started to come to pass. So one of these in particular was someone that I was personally engaging with and she and her husband had to make a personal decision during the shutdown when all, all of the kids were being um, doing school online. They actually made a decision to send their child to go live with a relative a few hours away so that there could be oversight and some connection that was going to be there with their with their child. And them just, you know, when I would see her and ask her how she was feeling about that, how she what she was, what was happening internally for her. And here she is in the office and just just like how heartbreaking it was. They knew it was the right decision, but it was such a difficult decision. And they just leaned on that they were grateful that they even had some place, a relative that they felt they could trust to be able to take in their child because they knew like other people that she was interacting with, they didn't have that as an option. There's another story that one of our other chaplains brought up where that particular person, their child, because of the isolation and both the parents had to still go into the office and because of the isolation, they started to notice that uh, she started cutting. And so she started reaching out to the chaplains and asking for some help and resources and connections. And they were able to really come alongside of her and help her in that area. And then in her workplace, she did feel like she could communicate with them. And they actually allowed her to start working from home so that she could be there with her child. They even gave her some time off so they could do a few family trips here and there just for the mental health of their child. But that was something that was just blew my mind because that's not an ordinary circumstance. And one of the biggest things I was running into as far as women is being able to communicate that need to whoever, wherever they were working in the workplace because they felt like they had to work twice as hard and be twice as tough as the guys to be able to really hold their position. And they were being torn as it was with what was happening at home with their kids and here they're having to be in the office. And so uh, a lot, very similar across the board, just a lot of whatever we were carrying as women was just so highlighted during all of this, especially that identity part. And what do I do and how do I hold my position? But now I have my kids at home and who's gonna oversee them, who's gonna encourage them and they're struggling as well. Those are wonderful examples, thank you. And what do you think are some common pivots many women are experiencing this season? How do you think these constant changes in roles and expectations may be impacting women in, work, in the workplace specifically, Brenda? Well, I think that you mentioned, and I believe Jordan might've mentioned it as well, this the whole idea of identity as women that's already a challenge as it is when you're trying to wear so many hats and fill so many different roles. Uh, whether you're a mom or not, you're filling so many different roles, always this feeling that you have to prove yourself. And so I felt like there was a lot of that coming up that I have to work even harder now. And do I have the freedom to communicate with my superior what I'm feeling? And if I communicate what I'm feeling, am I going to be seen as being weak? Because as women, I think we all know, we navigate our emotions very differently than men do, but it doesn't mean that we're weak. We just navigate it differently. There was one webinar that we did and that particular company, that uh, director asked a question, which I was so appreciative that he asked. He asked a question, 
what can we do to be able to really be there for our employees? And the answer that came back was to please listen to your employees. Before you get into the business part, ask them, how are you doing? How are things at home? home. If you happen to know something is going on with them, ask them specifically about that before you get into the business part. And you could tell he genuinely wanted to know how he can connect with his employees. And I just love that he actually did that because it really gives us permission to communicate and not be seen as being weak because we are communicating some emotion. I love it. It's so normalizing and healthy for all of us because I think all of us would struggle with feeling like, are they going to perceive me as weak or incompetent, not capable of fulfilling my role? And so we're hoping to remove that myth and create a space where it's safe in the right settings um, to just kind of take off that cape and to be honest with where we're at and to share from our own experiences. So thank you, Brenda. Those are great examples. Um, Okay. Our next question is for Jeanette. I know Marketplace Chaplains has a white paper gathering data on people across every industry to identify mental health trends in employees and in the C-suite specifically as well. What are some of the mental health statistics? Yeah, you know, um, one of the first things I'll probably start off before going right into the statistics is a recent story about a executive who, after eight years with his uh, business partner, his business partner committed suicide. And this executive said, I didn't know what to do. I worked with this guy for eight years. We were partners. We were running this firm. And he had this, how do I even process this? And then he had all these people that, he, that worked for him how are they going to process this? And through his searching, he ended up finding our organization, Marketplace Chaplains, as a resource to support him and his people to walk through this tragedy. And just it just was shaking. And he goes, if I'm if I as an executive am hurting and I don't even know where to turn, what about my people? What are they bringing to work every day? And so this is this is where we're seeing um, from everywhere from like chap- like what Chaplain Brenda shared everywhere from on the on the front lines of a company where they're fi- interfacing with with customers and 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 the products to the executive suite. It's affecting everybody and everyone needs support and help and someone safe to talk to. And according to this, uh, we, so the white paper that you referenced, we actually have that we, um, it's a white paper. It's got um, psychologists that have contributed to this. We have facts from the CDC. Uh, We have statistics from our own organization, but it's really a tool to create awareness about what is really going on. We produced that late last year. Um, However, all of us know this is a topic of conversation that's going to continue for a while. And um, what are we doing to not be reactive, but proactive when it comes to our own mental health, but also the health, the mental health of our people that we steward. And if we're a part of the C-suite, the people that were around in the C-suite and um, a, a Harvard Business Review, they put out a study and this was last year. And they said of the executives of all the CEOs that they had, um, they had surveyed, Uh, half, more than half. So they had 61% of these CEOs who we already know they're in a lonely place. They are extra lonely. So loneliness and isolation is 61% of our executive C-suites across the United States. This is where they're at, according to Harvard Business Review. And if we really realize that, the isolation, as as you know, Shannon, as a, as a doctor of psychology, as a therapist, isolation is the worst thing anybody can go through. And we've experienced that all last year. And now we're talking about people who are running companies and then they're dealing with all these other people who have isolation issues. Oh my goodness. So not to be a downer, but this is just facts of what's happening across the footprint um, of, of the workplace. And with isolation, we see rising this depression. What happens with depression? Depression it, it has so many little webs off of depression and different people are gonna react different ways. And so what we're seeing is a, as a t- uh, uptick in what we call mental health behaviors or issues, as well as substance abuse, uh, considering suicide when most people would have never considered suicide, but there's just this helplessness and this hopelessness. And many times what we see, and, and all of us can attest to this, when we have someone safe to talk to, whoa, all of a sudden we get it off our chest. Many times they don't have to really respond. They're just like an ear. We can just blah, say what's the ickiness inside of us and what we're thinking and feeling. And then all of a sudden we have a freedom and a place to make steps to get help. And our executives in the C-suite, that is something that um, we, we just, 
many times we're always giving, caring, doing all these things for our people, but we need to take time to do this inward thing as well. And how do we do that in a safe, a safe manner? And do we ever do that? And so creating awareness that we're not alone. If we're in these areas where we're part of a company and we're an executive and we're running a company, we feel such so isolated. A lot of times we hear these lies that we're alone. We're not alone. Yeah. There's so many people look at over 61% of people just like us are having mm-hmm. the same feelings. So what do we do? And, um, and so that is just, this is part of our conversation. What do we do? And uh, we want to make sure that people know about marketplace chaplains, but also know that there's a safe place to come to. And this is a great place at forward to have this conversation. I love it. And it looks Mm -hmm. like we have some questions in the chat that someone asked, can they get a copy of the white paper? And it looks like the link for the white paper will be with the recording of tonight's webinar. So anybody who wants to look at that, it is available and there's incredible statistics and you can take it back and even use that to verify your point that maybe your organization would benefit from having more support for mental health. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay, so our third question is to Quibia. Quibia, since you were the only female on your team of male colleagues, would you mind sharing from your personal experience of leading as a female and sharing how you think female leaders are being impacted at work? As we are trying to lead while still being human, in which life keeps happening at home, requiring us to constantly regain our footing and establish balance and then rebalance over and over, over and over. What are your thoughts and what do you think we're experiencing? So um, as a a woman, one of the lone women on my team, uh, you're definitely right in that there is a difference in how we process things. There is a difference in how we respond to things. But I, a lot of what's already been said is still applicable even to being a leader. It's normal to feel the feelings. Uh, as we know, life will happen. We heard about the pivots. Um, you can't tell death, no, not right now, because I have something to do. I have a meeting at five o'clock, right? And so one of the things I've seen is it's okay to have the feelings. It's so important to acknowledge what we feel as we're leading and don't feel like we have to be strong. I always tell people when I hear people say, you've got to be strong. I say there's strength in tears. Sometimes it takes tears. Sometimes there it needs, it takes us calling another person to talk to. Sometimes it's another woman. Sometimes it's a brother in Christ that you trust and you feel comfortable talking to, mm-hmm. but nonetheless, not trying to hold on to those feelings and behave like you are just so strong and you have to do it alone. Um, I think the other thing that I've seen also in leadership is balance, Um, Mm -hmm. determining balance, remembering what your priorities are, but also remembering that if you need a timeout, it's okay to pause, to Mm -hmm. pause in that moment and take that time out and address whatever is going on. Um, I I truly believe that even our, our brothers in ministry and in leadership, they encounter, we all know the same problems, they just respond differently. Uh, many of them are able to kind of hold on to their emotions in, in a, a unique manner. But guess what? We're just as unique. The only difference is we feel a little bit more free about talking to each other and just being expressive about what we're experiencing. And I believe that there's so much power in that because what I've seen is all the other individuals that might be serving, you're serving with, who you're leading, they will feel that much more comfortable talking yes. to you about life when things are happening to them versus feeling, oh, she's not going to understand. They'll know. They'll say, you know what, Quabio or Brenda, she'll totally get what I'm feeling. Let me talk with her about what's going on. So I really believe that just uh, going back to what I shared, um, taking a pause when you need to take a pause, remembering that you don't have to be strong, um, Mm -hmm. getting that balance, but also talking when you need to. I found it to be extremely priceless. Absolutely. And even just in a practical, so physiology, if we get too stressed, we're operating out of the back of our brain and we're going to make more errors. We're going to be more emotional and reactive in our decisions. Uh, So there's different brain waves. So to your point, taking that time and just going for a walk, clearing your head, turning off noise, not being overstimulated, then you're lowering your blood pressure, you're visualizing, I'm safe, I'm okay, I can do this. You can get your prefrontal back online. And so I just want to validate for a lot of people that feel like irritable and frustrated and you're just not working, like you feel broken. You're not. That is actually a physiological response that is completely normal. And we just have to learn kind of like if you were 
or a Maserati fancy car that you would learn how to steward that car instead of like Flintstoning your way, like trying to just force yourself to keep going. Because if you don't take that pause, then your brain is literally glitching and there's too much data. It's like your uh, brain is on overload. And so it's not able to, the executive reasoning is the last part of the brain to get energy. Everything from survival. And when we feel threat, stress, what's going to happen with my kids and school and all the overwhelming feelings, if we're not processing that, then it keeps all these little fires or minimized browser windows. And so that's draining from the ability to just be in your sweet spot where you're clean, linear, objective, and able to do your job well. So I just love that you pointed that out. Thank you, Kobia. Um, and our fourth question is for Rashia. As a common scenario, many women like you who are in the C-suite, um, who are leaders, may be the only woman also in an executive meeting, leading a large team and needing to use wisdom and discretion in her role. Rashia, you're the only female executive outside of your HR on your team. What is, the, what is that experience like for you? And what would you suggest to our female leaders as we use discretion? Sure. So the experience was a personal shift for me, as in my previous career, uh, my C-suite executives were women. So it took some readjustments for me in how to sit at a different table mm -hmm. with a new set of nuances. In a way, I had to find my voice all over again. And I had to remind myself that God had called me to that table. He had equipped me for that table and given me the grace to navigate it. Um, imposter syndrome is a real thing but I really had to push that thing back or it would cause me to withdraw and um, withdraw from the very conversation that God had placed me there to speak into. And so my suggestion would be to keep dipping your toe into the frigid uncomfortable until complete immersion feels like home. It feels mm -hmm. comfortable. That's so good. And as far as what to share with whom, I know that there's wisdom in whom to share. We, you know, guard your heart above all else. It's the wellspring of life. Don't put your pearls before swine. There's probably some people in some settings that maybe we shouldn't share with. What have you found uh, to be safe places for you to be able to share as you're in the C-suite? Uh, what's helped me is really having another female executive who could mentor me, who could be a safe place for prayer, um, to vent to, to just bounce um, theories and thoughts with, and maybe even um, share some ideas that I'm thinking about bringing to the table. Just another person who can speak into what's going on in my mind and um, give me um, permission to voice that at the table. That's, That's so been uh, really a true, true help for me. Yeah. I love that you're pointing on the fact that we don't want imposter syndrome or in psychology, we also call false self, where I'm trying to chameleon my way through, and then I'm not going to lean in. I'm not going to be aggressive when I need to be in appropriate settings to say, no, actually, I think this is a better course of action. And we undercut our own voice if we're in the false self trying to appease because that's a reactive posture rather than leaning in as a proactive and trusting that like an Esther, you are exactly positioned. So I love the confidence and the strength that you're speaking from. And I love that you have found a safe place with another person that understands your role, right? It's like somebody may not understand everything that you're going through. And so we can start praying into building those relationships so that we can be our best in the professional setting. And then when we're engaging with our kids or other roles we may be in. Thank you, Rashia. Thank you. Brenda. There is a trend that the higher you go, the fewer the women. For women in settings in which there might be less seats at the table for women, what are ways we can navigate the fear of there not being enough room for us? How can we come together as women? What is your experience and how would you encourage women to connect and support one another? Well, I absolutely love this question because I think it's really shedding light on something that, you know, if it's in the dark, it kind of has more power. And when you bring it out into the light, you take a lot of that power away. And so I'm really glad that it's coming out into that light that it's just something that I think somewhere we have believed the lie as women, that because there's fewer seats, the higher up you go for us, that once we get a seat, we have to fight the nail to keep it. And that means including fighting our sisters. And that's not true. 
we can help create some spaces where we can bring our sisters up as well, that we can be mentoring our sisters as well as they're on that journey. And we can share with them things that we've learned to do, not do how to navigate. A lot of things that the ladies have been sharing uh, just like get me all on fire because I love the fact that we can share this with each other. And then just what is exactly what Rashia was saying about getting a mentor connecting, networking with other women. Something that I did notice during the shutdown is that I started to see actually on my Instagram feed, on my stories, women from different industries that I know in different ways posting, hey, are there any other women out there and then whatever industry that they're in that you're looking to grow and that they were just, they realized that, okay, I don't have this network. I'm gonna create my own network. Mm -hmm. And they just went for it. And I just love that empowerment as a woman that we're not gonna wait for someone to come knocking at our door. I'm gonna go and find that. And they put the word out asking to say, who else wants to get together? Like-minded women that we're working, we're doing this, whether they have kids, you don't have kids, and how can we be an encouragement to each other? The other thing that I did notice was that during that time, I actually started to get more contacts as far as people wanting someone to walk with them, to encourage them. And it was exactly for that reason. They were looking for some safe spaces to be able to share the feelings like we were just talking about where this is okay for me to share the feelings. I'm not going to get judged. And then how do I develop some tools as to now when these feelings come up, maybe in the workplace and I can't share it the same way I'm sharing it with you, but what do I do? Okay, go for a walk, you know, controlling your breathing, doing some grounding exercises. What are some things that I can do exactly what you were talking about, where I can shift that energy from that, from the back to the front way of thinking. And there's such an openness right now. And I really believe that women, especially I'm seeing a lot of young women coming out and just saying, this is what we want to be able to do. And we want to be healthy and I want to be real with who I am and I'm willing to do the work. Where do I network? They're looking for places and other women to be able to network. I think that's going to be huge. I think it's going to be absolutely just monumental for women that this isn't a fight against men. This is not a fight against our sisters. This is about how do we come and we lock arms together and we share with each other. We encourage each other. We remind each other, just like we were saying, you were, you were meant for this. You were called into this. You were equipped for this. And whatever the gaps are, the Lord's going to fill those gaps. And you're gonna be okay. Keep going. So I just I love that we have like places like this that we can do that because it just shows that it's a snowball effect, and we're gonna keep doing it. Yes, absolutely. And I think I I can speak even for myself. I had a forward mentor during a real really critical period in my career, and I was so overwhelmed that they truly prayed about the mentor that I got, and they matched me so perfectly that when I was kind of fumbling and trying mm -hmm. to find my legs, having that safe place like Rashia and Brenda are talking about, and I'm sure all of us actually have mentors, um, but having that was so impactful, and it gave practical as well as just a safe place to talk and inspiration and you can do this. Um, and some of their story can also be really encouraging. And we just take off that veil, that false self, um, and we can be authentic. And it looks like um, we have a question from one of the audience members and we can all answer it. We, I can answer it however we want to do it, but I think it's a valid question. And I want to honor the person that's asked this. We got this question. Uh, how do you deal with trauma, for instance, death or murder and feeling sad or depressed while still having to work and operate daily? Must we fake it till we make it? Is there anybody that would like to answer that? I'll start. Oh, Quibia, were you going to answer? I was. I'll go after you. It's okay. Oh, no, no. Go ahead. Why don't you go first? Um, part of what I thought of is um, I think it's okay to be honest with where you are. Actually, I know it is because the reality is in as much as you try to hold on um, and try to, as she says, fake it till you make it, it won't work. Uh, what I learned a long time ago with my own personal grief is grief doesn't go anywhere. It, as someone told me years ago, it's like a monkey on your back that until you acknowledge it, it's not gonna move. I, I can remember when my first husband passed away and I was trying to just go on and like she was saying, fake it till you make it. And I was in the worst place of all, worst place ever to actually feel grief. I was exercising and we were in the cool down and this song, I knew nothing about the song and I could just feel the feelings just come, I just start crying. 
Mm -hmm. And you know, you're stretching. And so obviously the person that's doing the exercises, she's looking at me like, are you okay? And I was like, no, I, I had to be honest in that moment. And, and so I think it's okay to pause, take a moment. Sometimes what that looks like is taking time off from work if it's possible. Um, that's why I'm thankful they, yes, they have bereavement. Sometimes that's not even enough, you know, four days, sometimes you need a month. Sometimes people need a year, but I, I think it's important to acknowledge your feelings and some of what we've already talked about also talking to someone about what you're feeling. So just yeah. wanted to share that. Yeah. And I mean, I see it every day in my office. So I want to validate that many people feel like the only option is to fake it till you make it. And it really doesn't need to be. Um, even for myself, my mom passed away uh, during October of 2020. And so I'm a clinical psychologist, a professor, consultant, like all the things don't stop. And um, in many organizations, you do have resources like EAP, employee assistance programs, where you are able to get some therapy at a, a probably, I think, I mean, I, I don't want to overspeak, but I think that it may help with the fees for the therapy sessions. Um, and then there's also FMLA legally that um, if you qualify, then you can also get time uh, pay, without pay um, to get time off, I believe it is. Um, and somebody can correct me if I'm saying those wrong, but I have lots of clients that use that time to just really invest in themselves. And in total transparency, I took time off of work and in our field is part, actually part of our ethics that if we know that we might be compromised in some way that we are supposed to pull back and not put ourselves in a position of what they'd call bootleg therapy, um, which could be in any position. It's just where you're kind of getting your needs met in ways that you're not supposed to in a work setting. And so as a therapist, uh, that, that could be very vulnerable where I'm unconsciously getting my needs met from somebody else, but we could do that in sales and management. We could get it in lots of ways. And um, I've heard examples of some managers who maybe are oversharing to their employees and that's putting a lot of stress on the employee and that's not an appropriate setting. So back to Rashia's uh, credit where she is finding a safe place that she's not doing that to her employee and expecting them to kind of hold her up and reassure her she's using it in the right setting. And then for myself, I just started, you know, booking my own inner healing and therapy. And, and so I just know that, you know, this is going to be a journey grief, whether it's a, a death or a loss of somebody that it's, it's really real and faking it till you make it is like walking on a fractured leg and the more pressure, the more time, the more triggers, the more anniversaries that you go through of the death and the loss um, or your own depression and sadness. It's like you're fracturing that to the point that now you have to go to the hospital. You know, like you, you can prevent a lot of mental health issues by being proactive. And I believe that's the heart of forward of why we're trying to do this. Many of us uh, have been in shock denial, right? We're high achievers. We can do this. We've been able to pull ourselves up by the bootstraps for a long time. And so we expect that we should be able to do it again in this season. Reason. But this is not normal. You have all of your existing normal stressors, every personality quirk leaning toward perfectionism or whatever might be your existing. And now you compound that with a world that has turned on its side a little bit. That's a lot. And so we just want to normalize that if anybody is struggling with thoughts, thoughts of suicide, depression, self-harm, alcoholism, overusing pain pills has increased where you may have had an injury and then starting to use pain pills in ways that are actually self self-medicating emotional pain. So if any of those issues, um, the loss of a loved one where you're having reoccurring dreams or thoughts or triggers or just a heaviness, truly just crying, letting somebody hug you and care about you will do far more than you could ever imagine. And the pro proactive preventative of going to therapy or a life coach or some kind of an investment in yourself so that you're not waiting until you have that huge compound fracture and it gets so much worse that now your job actually is in jeopardy. It would be far better to communicate ahead of time and then let them know, you know, I'm going to need this pocket of time uh, for a personal, and you don't necessarily have to tell them it's for therapy, but you can say, you know, I'm in a process and here's what I'm going to need as part of that plan. And I appreciate your support in this journey and I'll communicate as I know 
you know, what's coming, how I can best serve this business or corporation, or like me, if you're a CEO, then it's hard because I know the bottom line. I'm still the, the money maker. Um, everybody else contributes, but I'm actually the biggest profit earner, right? So I have the bottom dollar in my head as the owner, but then I also know um, to care for others well, it's a stewardship issue. I can't do that unless I put the oxygen mask on me first. And then now I am back up to normal speed. And I don't think that would have happened if I hadn't taken the time off to really invest in myself and let friends hug me and cry and snot and ugly and all the things, right? So that now my natural joy has come back. And then I just regularly go back on Wednesday and have my next cry and get it out and keep honoring my emotions and honoring the anniversaries of things. And I think that's really key as well if you've gone through something. Does anyone else have something they want to share along these lines? I do actually. Um, mm -hmm. Something happened today that just I think would be such a really good visual that I want to share. But first, um, I was actually diagnosed with PTSD before the shut, right before the shutdown happened, and I was able to pick up on some of the signs of something wasn't quite right. And then I went to see like, hey, what's going on? And here's what was really interesting to me: the the moment they told me it was PTSD. I started to think I've never served in the military because in my brain, even though I knew that that's not the only reason why you would have that, I just immediately went there and it just became, again, really empowering for me to understand what was happening. And now I had an avenue to be able to get the healing that I needed to work these different things out and get on a really healthy path. And I have all the tools in place that I need to be able to have that. So I have therapist and I have a spiritual director that I meet with very consistently. I have always had mentors in my life. And so I just know I need to have my team. That's a, This is my team. These are my people that they get the rawest form of me, but I had to be real with myself and be very careful with who I shared at what given time, what it was that was happening because my healing needed to be my healing for a certain given time. Now I'm at a certain place. I feel a lot better to be able to share that more openly, but at the time, this is needed to be my story and my journey. So the thing that happened today though, was that um, we're in Yosemite and we did a hike this morning and I have an, a horrible fear of heights. I mean, this like my body clenches up. I'm like hyperventilating. I'm thinking the worst case scenario. Like it says, and we go on this trail and I looked it up on YouTube. I thought we were set to go. And like, this is gonna be great. We're going up all these steps. They said there's railing. Okay, I can do that. And we're going up there. And it turns out the railing was like for a small part. And the rest of it is like 600 steps. And you can like see this cliff down and like, and it's crowded right now. I don't know, everyone came out. And there's like, it's just crowded. And I'm with my family and we get to a point and I just freeze. And my oldest son tells me, mom, you know what? Take a few steps going down because I can grind it out going up. But the coming down part is where I would really be really hard. And we started to come down and I realized I'm not gonna be able to do this. And so everyone starts to take the journey down and I'm just like, I'm frozen. My husband's helping me to get down, finally get down. And by the time we get down, I see the rest of my kids down at the bottom. I'm in tears because I'm highly competitive. Inwardly, I wanna push, I love to be out there. And I felt horrible that I couldn't finish it. We get back, we're getting ready. I'm getting ready to get on here. And I'm telling my husband, I just feel like I failed. And he tells me this, he's like, I don't see it that you failed. I see it that you did as much as you could do and you recognize what you could do and you couldn't do and you made the adjustment and then that's where you came back down. You were the one, you took control of that situation. And so that's what makes me think about what we're talking about right now. Not to see this as a failure or as a weakness, but when you recognize I need help and I'm gonna go and get that help, you are actually in control. That's not a fail. That is you being in control. So when you were just sharing, I started to think about what happened this morning and I feel a lot better now. And I was like, okay, okay, maybe next time I can go a little bit higher, but I did take control because it could have been a lot worse if I did fake it till I made it because I would have gone up there and it was a longer way down and I'm not sure what would have happened. Yeah. 
That's a great illustration. So for anyone out there who's listening, we are saying, hey, we're removing our veils that we go and have mentors, we have therapists, we have spiritual directors, we have people in our lives that we do the real work. We're not just talking about this. And so I hope you do as well, because the more that you stay in the false self or fake it till you make it, the more that your internal world is like, uh, like a dam where the emotions are bottling up and it will compromise your ability to engage logically. And you're more likely to have a temper, do something impulsive, develop coping mechanisms that you don't want to have to deal with and undo later. So by just getting it out, being honest, having integrity, and not like you don't have integrity, but just like integrity of soul, like this is where I'm at. And so even yesterday, you guys, I had my own inner healing session yesterday and I'm snot and crying and all these things. And so I text some friends and I'm like, Hey, I am practicing authenticity in my own life. So I am not going to go to the social gathering, but if this one friend wants to come over and just hug me, and then she was prepared, right? She wasn't expecting social fun, happy Shannon. She was expecting to like hug me as I cried again last night and missing my mom and just life. Like there's just a lot. And then you compound it with all the other things. So everything that we're going through, it's like that dam gets fuller and fuller and fuller and we can do it for a while. Shock denial is impressive. But I will tell you that by taking the time to invest today, I have like so much joy. And yesterday I did not. And so by just cleaning that out, like the garbage can, so it doesn't fester and ferment down there, that you honor your soul, you take time. And then there's the trust part that if you do tell somebody, or if you have to take a leave of absence and maybe it's unpaid, or you have to step back from a role, that that is very anxiety provoking. But I will tell you that the time I took off from work, the Lord filled in. So the other part of the story is as the CEO, not working my own business, uh, I can't supervise students, so they can't really do their work. You know, I can't really teach. I can't really do these roles. Those are my income sources. And just being in full transparency, I had to really consider the cost. And I felt like the Lord had said to me um, that I'm going to put you on my payroll. And I was like, I've never been on someone else's payroll. That's pretty cool. I don't know what that means. And he said that at the beginning of 2020 in like uh, January, February. And so the Lord is so faithful that when you're going to go through a trial, we, I didn't even know about the pandem pandemic when he said that. I had no idea that that was coming. I just knew his faithfulness. I knew he was preparing me to trust him through something, which, you know, could be a little nerve wracking, but I did the numbers. And last year I made just as much as the year before. And I worked far less, like exceptionally less. And yet the goodness of God, he really will carry you. And I'm not saying just willy nilly. I'm saying prayerfully decide, you know, talk to mentors, talk to people that are wise counselors in your life before just making a decision. But I want to give you that permission and that hope that God will sustain you. Even if you take a, a pause and you, like to Quabia's point, like if you need to do that, that's wisdom and you are succeeding uh, to Brenda's point that that stepping back in wisdom then you can launch forward kind of like how most of the time in scripture, we have our friends that are like pulled back into the wilderness or the desert, and then they launch into their calling in a greater element than if they had not done that at first. And so just, it will take faith to take those pauses, but he will reward your trust and your security in him. So our next question, Rashia, we have talked about the problem and I'm excited to address what are some healthy coping skills we can implement? What do you wish more women knew that could help? If someone is struggling with hopelessness, what are practical things we can be doing to help foster hope? Sure. Sometimes when we're struggling, we become tired in that treading of the water, you know? And so my first suggestion is to call in some help and just float for a minute to regain strength, to regain your perspective because exhaustion clouds our perception. And so, okay, what does help look like? And, and we've spoken about it earlier this evening. Help looks like calling a friend who understands true empathy, who can speak your needed love language of hope and perspective, or calling a therapist and uh, someone to give you an objective view 
and tangible toolkit for navigation. I'm one of those people It's like, okay, that's great. But how do I navigate? Can you give me a toolkit of what do I do to navigate that? So that's important. Uh, Brenda has spoken about the next point and that is to take some deep, steady, metered breaths. Mm -hmm. Breath work can work wonders on the body, the mind, the heart rate, which will give life to the things that you're mourning. So I would encourage you to start with 60 seconds when you do it, but be present. Find one thing to be thankful for in that moment. Set aside the past. Don't worry about the future. Just settle into the present. Mm -hmm. The last thing I would say is science is catching up with God, what God has said in his word about our minds. So the word says, be transformed by the renewing of your minds, Romans 12 2. destroy every lofty opinion and every thought captive, 2 Corinthians 10, 5. So focus on truth and leave opinions behind. And the way I navigate that is to stop at the period. So if Quavia walks down the hallway and she didn't speak, Quavia walked down the hallway not having an opinion about it. Maybe she's mad at me. Maybe I said something wrong. Maybe I spoke up when I shouldn't have. Just observing what happened and not necessarily having an opinion about it. But meditate on the truth. And here are some universal truths. Life is worth living and it's my birthright. Woke up this morning, so there is a purpose for me. I have an assigned collaborator in this life and that's the Holy Spirit. Therefore, I am not alone. Celebrate the small things and meditate on that. Remind yourself of that. And if that means setting alarms in your phone with the title of what you are to meditate on throughout the day to cultivate that shifting of your mind, do it. I love it. And they said, if we had a minute, that we could ask some of the other panelists if any of you want to contribute, you're welcome as well. I will add that uh, you have parts of self and picture that each emotion you have is like a part of you. And I'm pretty convinced the movie Inside Out was made by a psychoanalytic psychologist because it's so valuable. And many times, me as well, I want to deny and suppress and ignore anything I perceive as bad, weak, unattractive, uh, you know, anger, all those emotions that are taboo, uh, but actually are the root pain pockets that then lead to whatever that surface fruit issue in your life that you're like, oh my gosh, why do I do that? Why does the intrusive thought keep coming back? Why do I want to just eat all the sugar around me? Why do I have to drink every night just to go to sleep? Because I just have to cut the edge off. Why do I do that? Because there's parts of you that you're not acknowledging. So a big part of mental health is radical acceptance of acknowledging I am feeling sad and it's okay to feel sad. That's normal and it's healthy, even if I don't understand it or it doesn't make sense or normally I would be fine, but I'm not. Many times we're actually triggered. So the surface issue is not that big of a deal. And so I can easily dismiss it and minimize my experience thinking that's dumb. What is wrong with me? I'm PMSing, just you know, watch some more TV. But if instead I journal and I process and I give myself permission to say, I feel pissed, I feel angry, I feel sad, I feel disappointed. These are normal, healthy emotions. And then if you make a triangle and you say, today I'm feeling this about this situation, what other time in my life might I have been feeling something similar that today is triggering? So you're creating a triangle where you're using, I'm feeling this, what is the situation and what symbolically, not literally, something just a little bit symbolic that's similar. And now you can actually go back and reprocess an original trauma, something that whether big case trauma or just little case that maybe you didn't even notice affected you at the time. Because again, shock denial is this wonderful little insulating bubble that protects us from realizing how much things actually did affect us. And so as we go back and we process, now you're finally giving permission for old or latent emotion to finally come out of the dam and be released. Just punching a wall, just getting angry, just crying and self-pity is not going to help. What is going to help is if I take time to say, hey, soul, what are you feeling? 
And even if I don't think that I should be feeling that, and even if I don't want to camp there of being angry the rest of my life, I need to acknowledge anger, sadness, um, questioning, bargaining, trying to make sense of everything, false responsibility, false guilt, all of these questions that you may be feeling, which sometimes is the intrusive thoughts. If you can just go back and process it at the root issue, you will actually gain more ground by going through the current trigger than if you had never gone through it because you still have that unconscious door or landmine that the enemy knows in what situation to hit that and then trigger you and get you to act, you know, uh, pouty in a business meeting or to chew out your staff or to say or do something that you're like, oh my gosh, why did I respond to that Facebook message to that guy that I know I shouldn't be talking to? And you know, are opening doors emotionally that you know you shouldn't be opening. Um, and a lot of emotional affairs have happened in the last 18 months because isolation and lack of stewardship of emotions drive us toward intimacy. And so it's a really vulnerable time if we're not stewarding, to Rashia's uh, credit, if we're not taking our thoughts captive and realizing what am I feeling, why am I feeling that, and then going back, then we're more likely to make an impulsive decision because think about it, if you're drowning, you're just going to take any old, you know, life preserver, even if it's not the right one. And it could actually lead to more problems in your life. We are more likely to make reckless decisions. If we don't sit down journal process and give yourself permission to say, whether I like it or not, I'm angry. I'm sad. I'm hurt. I'm frustrated. I feel betrayed. I feel disappointed. And then what other times in my life have I felt that? And then you step back and you visualize hugging the you that went through that originally. And then you extract any lies. What lie did I believe during that time that I have to protect myself, that I have to always be strong. I have to always be on. I can't show weakness, whatever the lie was. And now I reject that lie and I cancel it saying, no, that's not a true statement. What is true is I am safe in certain relationships to share my heart, my emotions, what I'm processing. Processing. My heart is in a good place. Um, it is strong to Quibia's pro, uh, point that tears are strength to be honest and authentic and then create space where, again, there's a difference between putting all your problems and making your employees or staff your, your little trash can to hold your emotional baggage. That's not appropriate. What is appropriate is sharing enough that you're authentic and it creates a safe place for other people to feel they can take their mask off. And again, the same goes with your children. Um, and it's to a degree, you also want to protect your marriage. A lot of people use their spouse as their one point per person. And that's okay for a little bit. But if that is your one point person, that's not healthy. Your spouse is not designed to be your therapist. We do need to diversify and allow other people to speak into our lives and to be our listening ears. So if you're dealing with something, please, please, please diversify who you're talking to, and then take time to say, I acknowledge what I'm feeling right? So I'm taking something unconscious that's bubbling up that I've been whack a mole back down. And now I'm giving language to it. I'm bringing it to the prefrontal by naming it and saying, huh, I think that I'm really frustrated and hurt and disappointed. Huh, I didn't realize I was feeling that about that situation. And I give myself permission to feel that and to release it. And then you walk through the forgiveness of the people today and the people of the past. So now that burden of holding on to that debt that you feel that person, individual, politician, uh, boss, whomever, um, that you're now releasing that, that that's not staying in a browser window on the inside of you that's still running in the background, causing a bitter root. And then I would recommend that you ask Jesus to take the bitter root out of your heart. That's a spiritual work that um, therapy alone can't do that. And I have felt the difference where I've done the work, I've forgiven, I extracted the lie, replaced it with truth. And I still just had this, every time I thought about that person, I just still had something ugly in my heart. And so just by learning that principle of like, oh, there's an actual bitterness that has formed through unprocessed pain that stayed in for too long and it turned into bitterness. And so I asked the Lord to take the bitter root out of my heart so that that living water, that fruit of the spirit can start pouring again. So um, I think we have a couple more questions, but I do want to make sure we ask Jeanette, if someone is listening and realizing their own business or organization would benefit from having chaplains to invest in their employees, how might someone connect with marketplace chaplains to find out how chaplains can help their organization and what resources might be available? Sure. 
Yes, you know, those of you who have been listening and a part of this conversation tonight, uh, as you listen to Chaplain Brenda, as you listen to um, one of our leaders, Kwabia, who's out in the field, I mean, they're out in the field, they're out and about, they're engaging with company leaders, engaging with employees in the marketplace. Um, this is the representation of our front lines. And then Rashia is one of our executive leaders who manages teams of Kwabias across the country. And, you know, it's an honor for us to join this conversation and to share with you the inside uh, or give you a snapshot of our over 1700 chaplains across the company, across the United States. And we have, um, you know, a number of companies, private and public, every industry you can think of. So if you're in an industry, maybe you say, oh my goodness, I don't know, we have cubicles everywhere. I don't even know how this would look if we had a chaplain visit. Or maybe you say we're an oil and gas company and we got rigs out in remote areas. Maybe you say I'm a nonprofit and how in the world could this happen? We love to have conversation. We love to hear what your culture is like and then how we could come alongside you, enhance and broaden. One of the things, uh, Shannon, that you had shared was about uh, employee assisted programs and a lot of companies have amazing internal structures, which we say, hey, this is awesome. When we think of a chaplain care team that comes alongside it with you and your company, we're actually partnering with you in expanding, enhancing, and broadening uh, that reach. And hopefully, as we were all talking about, a chaplain can become that safe place. So if you say, I don't even know where to go to a therapist, or I don't even know, uh, how do I even get into these things? A chaplain can help connect to professional resources like a Shannon in your community. Uh, or maybe you don't have money to get these things uh, taken care of, or someone that you know in your organization is just struggling financially. We can, as chaplain teams, find resources in the community, connect you confidentially so you can get the help you need. And so if that's something that you say as a company leader, maybe you're a company leader, maybe you're an employee and you say, hey, I want my leadership to know about this resource. <laughs> All you got to do is go to our website. And so it is www.mchapusa.com. So that's mchapusa.com. There's a place where you can directly call a cell phone number if you're like, we want to talk now. Or you can actually submit a form and then we'll get back to you and, and, and ask, how can we help? What can we do? And we're here for you. I love that. Mm -hmm. And I want to respect uh, time, but there is a question. Jeanette, what are you learning as you speak to prospective clients in this season? Yeah. So as you can imagine, uh, many of you are in places where you're having to manage what's happening and fielding what's going on in our, our marketplace, our workplace today. Like we were talking about those earlier statistics. We're getting phone calls um, and it's more of in a reactive way. Uh, we've had a lot of suicides um, and I know we don't talk about it as much in, in the media, but it is a rampant. You have every age and it is, it, is, it is very, very sad. We have a lot of domestic violence that's happening on the job sites. We get called in, can you help? We have a lot of tragedies that we get. We actually get called in for crisis. We're happy to help, we're happy to be there. We, and if you're listening and you're watching us and you say, oh my goodness, we could use you right now, call us. We're care first, we're gonna, we're gonna, re, we're gonna send out the troops and we will be there to help you. But if you also say, I would like to keep you on a rhythm, I wanna be proactive. That's where a lot of our companies um, are calling us now saying, hey, look, we know down the road this year, we're going to probably see impact from what's going on. Uh, we want to get you in place now. So what we're, what I'm seeing in with the leaders that I'm meeting with is they're saying, um, for instance, I was meeting with a hospital in Houston and the CEO said, look, um, we just need you to care for our nurses and our doctors. Like we are desperate. We need help. They're burnout. Like we were talking about, like Shannon, you were talking about earlier, our workforce is burnt out. Uh, we, I was just at a conference last week in Salt Lake City and these leaders who run assisted living homes, so they have private homes where they have assisted living, uh, these franchisee owners are having to spend the night at the homes because they can't get enough caregivers. They can't get the staff. And so we have a big staffing shortage and a lot of leaders are, are burning out as well. And so that's what we're I, I'm hearing um, on this executive level, talking to executives saying, we need help, I need help. And I wanna, I wanna get you guys in place now so we can get you a part of our community, a part of our culture and care for us and our people. That's so good. Thank you, Jeanette. And our last question, Quibia, if someone is interested in becoming a chaplain or knows a male or a female who might be interested in becoming a chaplain, how might someone connect with Marketplace Chaplains to learn more about becoming a chaplain? Great question. Uh, most definitely you heard one website, but the other link that they could definitely go to is www.mchapcares.com 
C-A-R-E-S.com. There they will be greeted by the CEO, Dick DeWitt. They're here about Marketplace Chaplains, what it is to be a chaplain. And if they still feel that burning desire and that passion to serve, they can also click where it says available positions. All of the positions across the nation are found on that website. So it's an amazing organization to serve with. I love it. Thank you, everyone. And thank you for your authenticity and vulnerability and practical suggestions. We are going to wrap up for tonight. We want to honor your time. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And for those who have signed up and have a, you should be emailed a link for the follow-up conversation where we're going to get more intimate and just kind of do the real. So I love you guys. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for investing in yourself so you can lead well for your families, your workplace, your organization, and your community. Thanks guys. Bye.